Okay, well, thank you for coming to my keynote speech. Hopefully it can be somewhat inspiring or, or something. Uh, yeah, so a little history about myself. Um, I'm kind of a Midwest Gaming Classic alumni. Uh, I've been going to that show pretty much since the beginning. And I actually uh, named it. There was a contest many years ago to come up with a name for some little quaint Wisconsin show. And I won a free joystick. And I've been coming here ever since. And so uh, what Dan was thinking, Dan Lucen, the, the guy who runs that show, is like, hey, we're going to have some people from MGC talk at CypherCon and maybe vice versa so we can kind of merge the shows together. So, yeah, a little bit about me. I mean, you probably know about me if you're if you're here in this room. I used to be a graphic artist. I wasn't really, well, I mean, I was into computers when I was a kid, as a lot of you probably were. But, yeah, I started out as a graphic artist, and uh, I was just kind of, you know, doing my own thing. But I always, you know, I liked hacking when I was a kid. Anything I owned was torn apart. You know, all the radios, all the video game consoles, all the toys. I had the erector sets. So I was kind of into that as a kid. But then as I was a teenager, I drifted away from it, unfortunately. Um, if I could go back now and change anything, it would be to uh, say, hey, I would take my young self and shake myself and say, keep at this stuff. You'll be so much further along when you're an adult. But whatever, you know, we all drift from the primrose path. Well, anyway, so I was into it. But around 2000, I was into, you know, hacking again. And, you know, obviously, you know, hacking's a big thing. So I'm, you know, I'm like a physical mechanical hacker or hardware hacker, not necessarily a software hacker. So my big thing was video game consoles. I really liked the old Ataris when I was growing up. And I thought, it would be really cool if I could hack this into something smaller and more portable. And this was back before they had, like, color Game Boys or backlit things, you know, before they even had PDAs. So... You know, it seemed like there could be a lot of, you know, cool things to do there. So what I did was I did a project, and I put it on GeoCities, I think it was, back in 2000. And uh, people really got a kick out of it. So this is it. Oh, so I realized I can use my Microsoft Pen. This thing, look at that. Boom, right in the end zone. Uh, yeah, so... As I said, I was a graphic artist, and uh, we also had CNC machines, so I was, you know, I was doing a lot of... Um, well, I would consider it quite rudimentary now, but you know, a d mechanical design, a design for CNC milling and whatnot. So I had those skills, and I was like, I could make, I could hack up something really cool. So I dragged this old Atari 2600 video game console out of a out of a barn, you know, again, Midwest Gaming Classic video games, and I put it through the bandsaw and I hacked it up. I'm like, you don't need this, you don't need this, you don't need this, you don't need this. What is the minimum you need to make this run? And I created this really cool portable that you see on the right there and that's the original one that I ever made and you know so it was, it's, it was hardware hacking and obviously back in the 70s they had all sorts of RF shielding on things like they had like inch thick or not inch thick eighth inch thick aluminum which is still ridiculous by today's standards yeah so I started doing that that was my early hacking stuff so yeah what I want to do today is talk about like some of the stuff I've done if you haven't seen it before and then you know talk about how you know how I feel about hacking how I think it's important and you know hopefully you know leave you with a message of joy and hope so look at these terrible, this terrible wiring job. So, I mean, this is a really horrible hack. I mean, I, I look at this now and I'm fairly embarrassed by my soldering skills. They're a little better now. But it was really important because back then, this is like around 2000, there really wasn't what you have, quote unquote, the maker movement now. I mean, there wasn't much. Um, if you look over on the right-hand side here, this is a, uh, a diagram of how to get composite video from a 1970s video game console. And... Back then, my terrible drawings were the best because nobody else had really done it. So it, it was really quite a different world. And much like you know, early hackers back in the 70s and 80s were trying to figure out how the computer systems work, I had to figure out how a lot of these old video game consoles worked so I could share the information with people that wanted to um, you know, mod their own things. Now, also, if you're interested in video game consoles, there's a bit-built room uh, right down the hall. It's a lot of the people that were on my website back in the day, and now they've advanced far beyond what I could ever do, so you should check out their work. It's very impressive. Uh, yeah, so that's what I started doing. I created a website back in, like, 2004. I still have it, benheck.com, sevenletter.com for the win. Uh, yeah, it's been pretty cool. So anyway, I was like, this is really cool. This is, like, really fun. So I just I started hacking more things. And luckily, since I was a graphic artist, I was good at drawing things and, you know, also building them in the real world. So my big thing back then, I wasn't very good at electronics. I'm still only just passable, but I can make things look good. That's what matters. So, yeah, I made some of these new cool Ataris here. There's like a wooden one on the right. This was actually uh, bought a, like a, a stair step at Menards or, you know, Home Depot. Oh, wait, you're from Wisconsin, so I can say Menards. You know what that means. Uh, yeah, it was really fun. 
And so anyway, I started branching off into more computers and different things. Um, Super Nintendo was really cool. I tried to make a console that looked like kind of like a question mark block that Mario would hit his head against. And it was really fun just like capturing the aesthetic of those original consoles so you felt like you were in the 80s because so much of this is about nostalgia and how you feel. And so if you can make someone feel like they're, you know, oh, it's my childhood. I've relived it. That's really the key. And what I started doing around this time, around 2001, you know, I was still, you know, working full time, but... I started building things on the sides and I was selling them and I was turning it into a little business and I'll get into that a little later, but I think it's just really amazing. Like if you make something really cool, people will gravitate toward it. Um, even here on the right hand, this is a um, Apple 2GS, which is my favorite classic Apple computer. The 2GS, GS meaning graphics and sound. Yes, I think they probably have one in the other room. Uh, yeah, so let me just show you a few other things that I have here that I did. Uh, yeah, so I started branching out into other things, you know, hacking more things. And um, Commodore is really cool. So I think about it, I try not to think about things that I necessarily love the most. Like I was an Atari 800 kid. Uh, so, of course, I, at, you know, in theory, I should be at war with the Commodore people, even though the system is superior. I have to admit that from a technical standpoint. But I started branching out. I'm like, okay, well, people like Commodore. So I made, again, I was like, let's make something that looks like it's from the 80s. So. The, the original hardware is in there. It hasn't been hacked too much, but it's all about giving it, you know, a, a new look, making sure, you know, the original keyboard works so it looks and feels the same and still works. Although if you look in the front of it here really closely, uh, there's an SD card slot. Um, that's become more prevalent now, but back in the mid-2000s, there weren't a whole lot of solutions for disk drive emulation. Nowadays, they have them, you know, falling off of trees. Uh, another thing I did that was really popular around 12 years ago was I started getting into the Xbox 360. For some reason, I'm like, I'm going to make an Xbox 360 laptop. I don't know why, but my God, it was popular. Everyone wanted it. Um, this one was actually done for, well, they're defunct now, THQ, but I also did a lot of um, work with video game companies where I would make them promotional items. So that's actually worked out pretty well. And I'll get into that a little bit more as we go through the talk. I want to make sure I do it in 45 minutes because I... I love being punctual or on time, I should say. Use all the correct bits. I uh, branched off into other things. I was doing PlayStation uh, 2 portable. This one's quite large. Again, if you want to see some great evolutions of these ideas, go into the bit built room. They've got some amazing stuff in there. Because as I went off and became corporate with my show, they kept hacking and they've, they've eclipsed me by now. Uh, yeah, oh, this is another fun one Neo Geo. You can take the arcade machine and basically make it down into that because as some of you might know there's not much in arcade machines uh yeah oh here's a few more uh, another another version of the commodore here on the right I actually made two of those because what will happen what i used to do is i would just build something i thought was really cool i'm like oh wow i really like the commodore i really like the, the, the atari i like the apple 2gs then i would just randomly build things and then i would just put them online and people would always buy them which is really cool i've kind of gotten away from that because i haven't had time maybe i'll get back into it in the future Oh, and the, yeah, on the left here, we have a PlayStation 3 that's been hacked down into a more portable form. Now, I, I should uh, preface this by saying I don't do, like, the kind of hacking where you, you can play, like, ROMs or hacked discs. I try to stay away from that because I'm usually, maybe this is sacrosanct to say, I'm usually pretty cozy with video game companies and developers, so I kind of want to stay on their good side. So, But, yeah. Anyway, so I did that for quite a long time, and along the way... I quit my day job. You know, what, what do they say? Don't quit your day job. Well, I did quit my day job. And uh, I, wrote, I wrote a book about hacking. And, uh, but yeah, I don't know. It worked out pretty well because I was always, I was like, okay, someday I'll get back to working for the man. I get back to working for the man. But I never really did because, you know, if you hack it, they will come. All these people are continuing to ask for new cool things. And I just kept building them. And I just, I don't know. I never, I didn't have time to go back to a normal job. I guess that's kind of the dream, but it can also be, the hell, because if, we're, if your hobby becomes your job, then you have to find a new hobby. That's something that, good advice for everyone. So, around 2010, we started doing the Ben Heck Show. And just for the record, I didn't want it to be called the Ben Heck Show, because I'm not that egotistical. I'm selfish, not egotistical. Completely different. Uh, yeah, but this ad agency was like, hey, we have this client, Element 14, which is part of Premier Farnell, Newark, an electronics distributor. And they want to have an online you know, presence about um, electronics and hacking and getting people excited about their community. Would you like to make a web series for them? And I was like, yeah, sure. This sounds cool because this is around 2010. Uh, obviously, YouTube existed, but it wasn't really in the form that it is today. 
So I said, yeah, I'll, I'll take a shot at it. And um, the plan was to build cool devices that serve a purpose instead of just doing things for show. And uh, Joe and I were talking about this yesterday, how, I mean, of course, I was a big Mythbusters fan, but it seemed like they were usually just blowing things up all the time. So (laughs) I wanted to, you know, make things for accessibility or hack existing products so they could help people who might not be as abled as, you know, you or I. You know, of course, we've done a lot of fluff along the way, but that was kind of my idea. Anyway, we started it in 2010 as bi-weekly episodes, uh, doing it part-time. By 2012, we were doing it every week and working full-time. So a lot of people have asked me, Ben, why are you leaving your show, which is called The Ben Heck Show? And I tell them that I've had eight years of one- to two-week deadlines, and it's really taken a toll on me, and I I need a break. So that's why we're we're quitting it, although there's 350 episodes by the time we're done, so... you can watch it for eternity, just like The Simpsons, you know, never ending. So anyway, uh, yeah, so this is what we did in the show. So with the show, we branched out from just video games. Like until this time, I was all about video games, but we tried to, you know, do some more things. Although here on the left is, voila, a video game system. That one was something we hacked up for, uh, I think it was like a contractor over in Iraq. They kept getting sand clogged into their video game console. I don't know if you've uh, met anyone who was in the uh, the second Iraq war, but there was a lot of Xbox playing going on, apparently. And, uh, yeah, and sand clogging up the fans was a, a big issue. So if you can see right here, there's actually a filter system on the fan. So, I mean, that's something you might not think about. Like, well, you see it with pet hair, too. I'm sure that's probably a better use, you know, domestically. Yeah, so when we started doing the show, I just wanted to do kind of random cool hacks. And a big thing for me... You know, as I mentioned, I was, you know, building things for people on demand, you know, client work. But with the show, since we had a budget, I was able to justify things that might not necessarily make sense. So I did some cool things. Like I tried to make a domestic uh, electronic can crusher, which I still haven't really nailed. Or this, which is a computer heatsink Peltier aluminum can cooler. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Peltier's, but it's a device that can uh, basically transfer heat through um, electricity. Well, it doesn't, I'm sorry, the electricity doesn't make the heat transfer. It can basically pulls all the heat away from the can, dumps it into the heat sink, and then blows it away. So, you know, we started doing cool things like that. Around this time, I know this is maybe isn't really the fort of the, the hacker scene, but I really got into 3D printers. And 3D printers kind of started out when I first saw them, I'm like, well, that's a great gimmick. You can make a bottle opener with a penny. Who cares? But then I started getting into them, and I was like, my God, I was so wrong. I mean, I love 3D printers. I think they're, I don't think it's one of those things where every home is going to have one, maybe in 100 years when we have replicators like Star Trek, but I really got into it. And for some reason, I thought I could, you know, I started making my own. Like both of these here, I, I designed myself. I and mean, we have all of your lovely uh, wood and laser slot. A construction there. But the thing that I found interesting about 3D printers as far as, you know, hackers go is that they've existed for decades. But what happened was entrepreneurs, uh, yes, including people like Maker Bob, but also Joseph Prusa, figured out a way to hack it down and make it available for the masses. And I think that's what's really important about any sort of movement or kind of alternative manufacturing is you know, figuring out ways to, you know, make things work for everyone. I think that was really what made 3D printers explode. So instead of having like a $30,000 Stratasys, you could have a $1,000 MakerBot or a $1,200 Prusa. And I really got into it and I've really enjoyed it working with it over the years. And so speaking of hacking, this is something I've thought is um, no no solution is too silly, which is a point I'm probably going to harp upon quite a, quite a bit during my talk. The very first thing I printed with my first off-the-shelf 3D printer was a, a lid for my spam. Because if you eat the whole thing as spam, you'll probably die from, from sodium. <laughs> so I was like, okay. And uh, I don't know. It was, just, it was just fun for me. I wanted to... Uh, you can't buy a spam lid, but you can hack a spam lid. You really should put saran wrap on it, though, because it's not a perfect seal. And you can't really see it here. I tried to adjust the gain but because I printed in black, but... There's a little edge to it, so you can also use it to slice your spam, <laughs> because spam has a consistency of butter, as you may know. There's actually more flavors of spam than you might think. They have like specific flavors for different countries, even. So anyway, uh, yeah, that was something that. But here's here's the thing: no solution is too silly. I mean, you might make something that might 
Like, who would need this? Who would want this? But the thing that's great about the internet versus 100 years ago when you could only sell things to people that live in your own small town, someone out there will need it, and hopefully a lot of someones. And then you could even make a career out of it, which I'll get to in a little bit. So here's something kind of crazy. This is another thing that I probably wouldn't have uh, built unless we had the show. But there's this guy, and he's like, hey, um, I like to play pinball. As a lot of you might know, I'm into pinball. But this guy's like, I, I like to play pinball, but I only have my right arm. And of course, a pinball machine, you have to do this. You have to straddle it with your arms. Now, the first thing someone might think is like, okay, it's just a button. Drill a hole in the side of your games and stick a second button in there by your right hand, like this. But here's the thing, pinball machines are really, really, really expensive, and some of them are very desirable and rare and whatnot. So what if you go over to your buddy's house, and you know, your buddy's gonna be like, yeah, don't drill holes in my machines. So what we came up with for this guy, and this is something I really feel passionate about is accessibility and whatnot, is uh, it has suction cups. So you can slap this onto any game you want, and it's adjustable. There's little thumb screws here for the distance. And you put this on one side and it has two buttons. Now the upper one by this finger, that just presses the button that's underneath it, their existing one. But the second one activates a servo over here that actually pushes the other side button for you. So you can push both buttons with one hand on one side of the unit. And what I did was um, I measured, I think like five different manufacturers of pinball machines and I created an average target of where the button is in comparison to the glass angle in the front of the unit. And then I average that out and use it to create my design. So yeah, things like that. I don't think I would have bothered doing that just on my own, but with the show, it gave us a lot of flexibility to do some things that might be a little more time consuming than we'd otherwise have time for. So speaking of that, some other stuff we've hacked. So this guitar here on the left, this is uh, pretty crazy. I wish we had a bigger screen here. I'm sorry, I guess it's not my fault, but uh, I guess you can see that okay. So. There's this guy, and uh, I think he's from South America. And he's like, I, I, don't, I can't really do his accent, but uh, he's like, I used to play guitar, mate. Oh, wait, no, that's Australia. <laughs> I used to play guitar, and, but then I had to get a job on the railroad. <laughs> it's amazing the stories you hear. Once, once people find out you do accessibility, oh my God, you hear so many stories. Most of them involving motorcycles. Oh, I shouldn't say that because I'm in Milwaukee, but. <laughs> anyway, so this guy's like, those things were like locks together to lock the trains. Yeah, his arm got stuck in that. And he's like, now I can't play guitar anymore. And it's, this is a big thing. We learned this when we went to Walter Reed Medical Hospital too, is that when someone is in a horrible injury or they're incapacitated in some way, the most important thing is for them to get back to something in their old life so they can reclaim that. And if you're an able-bodied person, as most of us are, we take for granted all sorts of things, even like tying our shoes. But once something happens, it's completely different. So this guy could no longer play guitar because you have to strum and then you have to hold the keys or you know the strings to create the keys. So he's like, can you help? And again, it's one of those things where like if I had to bill him hourly to do it, it probably wouldn't have been affordable. But as a show project, we could justify it because on the show we're, we're sponsored, so we're all salaried. So you probably had the same thing with your, with your show. So we came up with this whole thing where there was a, it's not on camera here, but there's a foot pedal. And so he taps his foot to do the strumming. And then we have all these controls. So basically you can strum down, you can strum up, you can strum up and down. Because right here, well, we have a servo here, which does the left to right of the strum. And we also have a lift lever here. So it will actually strum, lift it up, bring it back over, bring it back down and strum again. And it actually worked out pretty well and had all the controls built into it. It's also really expensive to ship things to South America, it turns out. But uh, I'm sorry, South Africa. Yes, yeah, sorry. South America would probably also be really expensive, especially if it was Brazil. Uh, yeah, but it's, I don't know, that's, that's what I really enjoy is doing things like that. So again, as far as hacking goes, most people wouldn't think to do that, but this is the kind of things we've been lucky enough to do with the show. We can do really complicated builds like that and then help people. Or so in the right-hand photo, this dorky-looking photo of me, which is kind of impossible not to take because I'm dorky-looking. There's another one. This is a scene I had. Because I think about 
Actually, I saw, I was in New York just last weekend and I saw a person who I, I don't think was sighted. And I'm like, how would you deal with this? This is insane. It's hard enough if you have eyeballs. So this, this is another simple project. It's just uh, four ultrasonic sensors with uh, cell phone rumble motors. And it tells you where you are. So as you walk around, it's like, but it's all analog, right? So the closer you are to things, the more it rumbles. So you can get kind of like a spatial, I don't want to say image, but you get a spatial idea of where you are. So, I mean, that was a pretty simple build. It's just a microcontroller and a bunch of sensors, but stuff like that's been fun. So I've really enjoyed doing things like that. We've also, we've also done a few other uh, non-accessibility things. Well, most of them are. But again, like hacking, um, like uh, the one on the left here, that's a, a basic, well, it's clearly a video camera with an image tracker on it as well on a linear slide system. Uh, you know, so I was like, hey, what if you're making a video and you don't have a videographer? You know, what if you're not as fortunate as I am to have a sponsor and you have to do it yourself? So what this one would do is it would just, uh, I think it had a, it would track like a ball. So you'd have something, you'd say, okay, go here. And the camera would like, and it would like do the X, Y. I think it used Pixie, which was from Kickstarter. So that kind of stuff is fun. And then it's, you know, we have the matching 3D print to the background there. That's, that's great. Here's another hack. I mean, a lot of people do this. You can take a, uh, a toaster oven and turn it into a reflow oven. That's actually pretty straightforward to do. Um, yeah, but, you know, here where, um, where we are, you know, in, in America and stuff, we have uh, a lot of, you know, there a lot of things are already available to us. We don't actually have to hack a lot, a whole lot, which is cool. But I think that's important. We shouldn't lose sight of the fact that we still need to be innovating. You know, we can't just, you know, say, oh, we've got everything we need. We, you know, our cell phone now takes the place of 10 devices. So let's give up. And I kind of worry about that a little bit when I see these kids and they're like their whole life. And we, st we, we still need to keep going. So, uh, yeah. Oh, OK. Oh, I'm doing, doing great on time. So, yeah, just a few things that I've learned, you know, like just in my hacking past is if you hack it, they will come. Um, if you make something cool, somebody out there will want it. And, uh, you know, there's a phrase. Oh, man, sorry. Bad back. What is it? If you do something people need once a year, you can make a living. And if you do something they need every day, you'll, you'll, you'll be a zillionaire. And that's true. And, you know, if you think about the old days, you're like, oh, I'm, I'm in my little village and I've never gone 100 yards past my village. I guess it's like the beginning of The Hobbit, right? Um, but, you know, you're limited to, you know, the people around you. But now, you know, you've got, you have the whole world. So even if you have something as strange and niche as a uh, accessibility video game controller, it doesn't matter because the Internet can aggregate that across so many people. You can find enough people to keep you going. Like, um, I don't know how familiar you are with my show, but my assistant on the show, Felix, he does all of the uh, accessibility controller stuff now, and... He can't even keep up with that, and he does it as a side job. It's pretty insane, like, the number of people that actually need something like that. Speaking of which, uh, no hack is too stupid. Okay, so this mess that you see on the screen, this was the original prototype that we made for accessibility controllers. This is back in 2006. This guy emailed me, and he was like, hey, I was in Iraq, and my arm got blown off by one of those bomb things. And he comes back home, and what does he want to do? I mean, he wants to play video games. There's so many, well, like with that war, there was a lot of a lot of young people, and it was like the first, really the first war of the video game generation, which is strange to say, but, and yeah, if, if someone's injured, they want to get back to their existing life. So he's like, can you help me? And I'm like, this is really interesting. I hadn't even thought about it because, again, I don't think about this. I have two hands. I don't think about how hard, hard it might be to do. So I'm like, I will totally do this for you. And so I started gluing things together and putting like pieces of uh, wood on it and PCBs from Radio Shack, rip, hot glue, rumble motors, all this. I mean, this one was a mess. We've refined it a lot since then. But it looks kind of dumb and it kind of seems silly. But then we did that. And I guess this would be my message for anyone. I mean, you guys are probably all pretty much super hackers. But uh, even if something seems really stupid, you should still go for it. Because in the case of this... This led to me doing a retail product. It led to me doing uh, latency testing for uh, video game studios. We've built, God knows, hundreds upon, probably at least 500 of these things on our own. Um, Felix used it as a side form of income. It's insane how much came from that, just that one idea. And I didn't have to think of it. Someone brought it to me. I just had to execute it. So, yeah, I guess that would be my advice is just... Uh, it's never doesn't doesn't matter what it is. You should always give it a shot. And you know, this is what I've tried to do: never stop hacking. 
I have this old carpenter dude here. I probably won't live that long, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I try to do that myself. You know, I try not to become complacent with my show. I want to keep hacking. So when I'm done with the show, I can still continue to hack, like keep myself out there. But I don't know. I mean, you know, old people can hack stuff too. It doesn't always have to be like these 20 year old wonder kids. Uh, yeah. So I guess another thing I want to talk about is um, why we still need hackers when there's so much cool stuff already. And I just grabbed this picture of one of those Boston Dynamics super robots. I kind of like the one that looks like a mule dog thing. Well, it's kind of scary almost because it's, it's in Uncanny Valley because it looks like it's, you know, nature. Um, yeah, well, this is probably preaching to the choir with this kind of stuff. But I guess I'm talking about it from like kind of like a retail perspective. So I don't know, you know, consumerism and products are still mostly driven by large companies. And, you know, I don't have, I don't have anything against large companies, but large companies um, always focus on the larger market and not the niche use cases. So as I've said for myself, um, there's always there's always a need for small things and you might not necessarily think about it. Um, I've talked with people from Microsoft about the accessibility controllers that we make. And uh, one of the responses I get is, yeah, we, we understand it's a problem, but there aren't enough people that need it to justify manufacture of it. But then the uh, flip side of that is Felix <laughs> can't build enough of them in his spare time. And that really puts us a crossroads. Actually, 3D printing has helped a lot with that. So that's definitely something that's uh, that I appreciate. Um, yeah. So, I mean, if you think about it, like back in the 70s, you know, HP or Honeywell or IBM, they'd be like, we don't care about a person using a computer in their home. Nobody wants that. Nobody needs that. But then you had all those garage engineers like, uh, you know, Steve Jobs. Or I should say Steve Wozniak first, then Steve Jobs. They were building all that stuff and they're like, hey, it turns out people do want this. So granted, I think we might think that we have every innovation under the sun now, but they probably thought that back in the 70s as well. Like, oh my God, we have touchstone phones. We're done. So I think, uh, you know, again, never stop hacking. And another thing, hackers take a risk that large companies won't, as I talked about, you know, oh, we, you know, we can't afford to do an injection mold. We'll, we'll only sell 20,000 of. Uh, yeah, although companies make all sorts of other stupid crap and they don't, you know, they don't care then. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's a good thing that hackers can do. I mean, hacking shouldn't just be about risk, but um, just, yeah, doing the cool things. That's what I try to do, like the cool things other people might not think about. Because a lot of times, you know, we, you know, hackers, us, we live in the real world, not the focus group marketing bubble. You know, we see things. We're like, okay, that's something that we, I wish we could do. Um, I thought about like one thing I, I did for the show. I should have made a slide for it, but um, um, one thing that we did was, was really cool. We had robot luggage because <clears throat> uh, I'd always be going around the airport and hunched over, and I'm like, why can't my luggage follow me? And uh, that was one really cool project we did. It was pretty rudimentary. It just used ultrasonics, but. Uh, yeah, although I think companies are doing that now. So I, that's what I try to do. I just want to have really cool projects that uh, can, you know, help people and stuff. So, yeah, let me just uh, get through this here so I don't go over time. So, yeah, here's my inspirational message. Hacking is life. Hacking is the root of all progress. We'd be in caves if we didn't hack stick into weapons. I mean, think I know it's kind of stupid, but it's like, hey, fire was a hack. Weapons were a hack. It's, uh, it's just, I don't know, it's all connected. And uh, even with our advanced inventions now, hacking is what takes concepts to the next level. Okay, this is where it's a little bit more altruistic and stuff, but uh, we're all in this together and this is all we have to work with. Uh, again, you know, I kind of think about like, so many people are just obsessed with the cell phones now and the kids. I hope we have a, you know, the future generations can think outside this box a little bit uh, because you know, this is what we have to work with. And uh, yeah, but I think we can still make it better. And so I guess my final example here <clears throat> it might seem a little weird, but uh, a really good example of hacking is uh, Cuba. There's some insane stuff down there. But I think this should be inspirational because obviously, you know, we don't have the challenges they do, but we still, you know, it's still about what do you have to work with and how can you make it better? You know, they have insane stuff where like, oh, can't charge your hearing aid batteries and they figure this out or <clears throat> a literal TV dinner where they turn their TV trays into the antenna. That's pretty insane. But you know, it's not is that's not so much different than what we do here. We just don't have to do that, but we choose to do it. But I mean, heck, I mean, I would if I could, if I had a company, I'd bring up all these people from <laughs> Cuba to be engineers. They look how good they are. You know, they're making bikes out of stuff, and they're well. This is this isn't much of a hack. <coughs> 
it's pretty insane. But I guess the reason I bring it up is because, um, yeah, that kind of shows, you know, how hackers can actually help a country survive or help a people survive. And uh, we shouldn't lose sight of that just because we have everything pretty much here. We still should be thinking about hacking, how we can change things. And, you know, it might be something as, you know, trivial as a video game console or maybe somewhat more altruistic as, you know, making an accessibility console. But it's, you know, don't take your harbor for face value. See what you can do with it. Hack it. You know, whatever corporation made it originally, they did it to a budget. They did it to a schedule. You know, it's not because they didn't want to make it better. They just ran out of time. And as hackers or homebrewists, we have the luxury of taking more time to do things and squeezing everything out of it. And one more slide about Cuba. Even if you don't want to stay in Cuba, you still have to hack your escape. So very, very, very hacky worthy down there. So yes, uh, excuse me. <coughs> Just a few more notes here. Uh, so for myself, uh, personal future projects, I want to get more into accessibility. I really think that's cool where they have the uh, 3D printed prosthetics because prosthetics are stupidly expensive. I don't know why. I think it'd be really cool if you could design it backwards from the from the hands, you can make it modular. Do you need this? Do you need this? Do you need this? Do you need this? And then just create what you need. I'd love to get into that kind of stuff. I'd love to have like a wall of 3D printers. That's my goal, like nine of them, like perfectly in a row. And they could just, you could just spool to them all day long. Uh, what I'd like to see from hacking, I guess, um, as I've mentioned a couple times, uh, I mean, the hacker movement or the maker movement as well is, you know, really incredible. I just hope that our kids don't get too wrapped up in cell phones and they still say, hey, we can get out there and build some stuff. Although, you know, if you think about it, if I go back to the 80s, my parents were probably like, oh, Ben, he's too wrapped up in his video games. He's not going to do anything besides video games. But then the video games can act as a gateway drug, so to speak, to get you excited into other things. <coughs> so hopefully, hopefully there's some cool stuff there. Uh, I think it was really cool was the... The Nintendo Switch uh, label or whatever that cardboard thing was. I don't know if you've seen that. That's really cool. Like, it's okay, here's your electronics. Now, here, here's how we get that into the real world. So hopefully you can see more stuff like that. Um, what hacking could do better? Um, well, I mean, it's a lot different than the 80s where there was a stigma about hackers. Everyone's like was trying to launch nukes or whatever. Uh, it's obviously that's not what it's about. <laughs> hopefully that's what it's about. But uh, yeah, maybe uh, you know, get more people excited about it. Um, have people not be complacent with their electronics like oh my gosh my selfie camera doesn't work okay figure something out or my, you know you f make it better yourself don't rely on the super corporations to do it for you because they're you know they're, they're thinking about what a billion people want not what one person wants but you know again you know a billion people didn't want a car until someone's like hey your horse sucks so you just never know until you do it um yeah so i guess where do we go from here i would say yeah just i hope i hope more people can hack I hope more people think about that stuff. That was kind of the whole reason I did the show was I wanted to inspire people to think about things differently. It's pretty insane now looking at it because I'll have someone come up and say, hey, I started watching your show. Then I went to college. I got a degree and now I'm an engineer. And I'm like, oh, my God, this show's been on that long. Yeah. It's insane to think about. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, that's pretty much it for my slides and all of my random stuff about uh, welding in Cuba. I wonder where they even get welding rods. I just find it fascinating, all right? Because it's like you're on a, it's almost like a deserted island, you know, like Danger Wolf Robinson. Like, where do you get stuff? Uh, yeah, so I guess uh, maybe like 10 minutes of questions and answers, and uh, that will wrap it up. So, but thanks for coming. Oh. Uh, Joe, Joe. Uh, what are some of your preferred tools for your modeling and kind of mechanical 3D printing side of things? Oh, yeah. Um, well, Element 14 um, distributes Autodesk, so we've been using Autodesk uh, Fusion 360 a lot. There are some limitations with it, but uh, I've been more or less happy with it. I used to do everything in two dimensions, but obviously three is better. Although a lot of, I still lay out things in two dimensions because sometimes that's all you need, especially when your machines are two-dimensional, especially like laser cutters. Um, there's other solutions. A lot of people use Blender. You can use Tinkercad, OpenSCAD. There's a lot of ways to do it. Uh, there are a lot of free solutions because I think, again, what a lot of the companies are doing are they're trying to get people, they're trying to get the maker movement into their products. I mean, if you think about like Arduino was a great Trojan horse for Atmel or whatever company owns it now, yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, sir. With, with everything becoming more and more designed to be disposable, yeah. do you think that helps or hurts the maker and the, and the... 
Well, I would say it hurts it. I was trying to fix my phone a couple weeks ago, and it's kind of embarrassing. Like, I couldn't do it. I, I would think I would be able to do it. Maybe I'm just out of touch or something. I mean, there's they, they do they do it for a reason, you know, because they make it look sexy. Screws aren't sexy. You know, you get through it, it's all screws. But it's like, yeah, you shouldn't have to break your phone to get into it. But that's the problem, like, I mean, that's what's happening right now with, like, video game consoles and televisions. Like, these stupid cell phones have basically taken over because it's like, we can sell someone a $600 piece of electronics every two years versus a $600 television every 10 years. And these things, basically making these things fragile pieces of crap have basically addicted the <laughs> manufacturers into, you know, basically having something that can't be repaired. But it really bugs me because I was like, what happens to all this stuff? I mean... There's gonna be, like we talk about AOL discs, for crying out loud, we're gonna be able to make a moon out of these eventually. Like, I always think that someday, I bet we're gonna have to mine our own garbage. Yeah, that'd be a good futuristic movie. Um, so I, I find it discouraging, especially because this is like the primo de facto technology that everyone has now. It's not like, you know, even like a laptop you can take apart, but it's too bad. And, and certainly you can't hand solder it. It's not like, you know, 40 years ago, I could make an expansion card for an Apple II, and like, you can't do that by hand here. Uh, anyone else? We got, we got a few minutes. Uh, yes? Okay, so when you do those uh, one-handed game controllers, yep. how do you test them, and are they ambidextrous? So what we do is we have a left and right handed model version of it, so it's not ambidextrous. And as far as testing goes, I usually just plug it into like a Windows computer and go into the menu. I used to text it on Xbox hardware, but I'm always worried that I'm going to accidentally rent like an Adam Sandler movie by pushing buttons randomly. So, you test them yourself? yes, I test them myself, and uh, I'm actually designing a new version now uh, that's for the PlayStation 4, which is something I've always wanted to do. But hopefully, when I'm done with the show, I'll actually have some time to uh, do it. And in that case, I'm actually modeling it as a right-handed unit because I'm right-handed and it's easy for me to test. And then once I have it all designed, I'll just mirror it in you know, Fusion or whatever, and then boom, have both versions. And that it'll just be a case of like which one I tell the printer to print. But that is a problem as a product because, yes, not only you have a niche product, but now you have two versions of it. And then even worse, well, actually, no, it's not because you could... Actually, no, it's true, because if you think about people who are left-handed versus right-handed, I mean, there's way more righties than lefties, so, you know, companies, they do discriminate against left-handed people. But then when you get into an injury, it is off, you, they usually lose their left hand because, they're, because most people are right-handed, they protect this one. So I have seen statistically that usually you end up with more right-handed controllers because the less dominant hand gets, basically it gets ruined more often. Anyone else? Yes, sir. My favorite failure? Um, I would say probably I made a Commodore 64 laptop around 10 years ago, not the one that was pictured, which is important. Uh, some guy commissioned it, he's like, I want a Commodore 64 laptop. And I was working on it forever, and I was having so much trouble with it. And this is, I was probably about 31 at the time, and I was thinking, oh, this sucks, this sucks. And I kept trying to make it work. And then eventually I'm like, this sucks. And so I took all the designs and I just threw them out. I took the case, I think I like, gave it away at a show like this, and I just started over. And then when I started it over, I came up with that, which I think was worked out really well. And, you know, it was a good lesson for me because it's like, you know, well, I'm also into, like, film production. I know it's completely off topic. But sometimes um, if an idea sucks, instead of trying to make it work, you just need to cut it off and start over. So that's why I felt the Commodore 64 failure was good because it taught me to start over. I've had some other f projects that... I would consider failures that I didn't learn from <laughs> or I just didn't care for, so I, I wouldn't list those as well. But the Commodore was a good failure. Uh, yes, sir, behind him. Uh, what was your like, most costly project that you, in your, by your standards, didn't really take? Like, either by time or money or both that didn't go anywhere? And, like, is that, should that deter me or is that because just I'm a student and I don't have, like, a full-time job or is that something? Like, is that where I am in my life where I can't do expensive projects? I don't know. I, have, like, I guess I have, like, three questions in one. So it sounds like you're in the middle of an expensive project and you're not sure if it's going to work? Yeah, that's what I mean. Okay. Well, well, I have ideas that I haven't, I haven't started. I'm in the middle. I don't want okay. To, I don't want to oh, so you don't want to start it and, and basically sink an expenditure that you can't recoup or justify? Yeah. <sighs> because, like, you know, should I wait until later in life? You know, like, maybe a few years when I graduate. What is it? Uh, well, I, I def when I started out, I, I definitely started small. Um, I talked about that Atari Portable that I made, 
And I remember driving back from Best Buy with this, you know, $190 pocket TV in my car seat next to me thinking, oh man, did I just waste $190 on this? What if it doesn't work out? And then I've made God knows how much money since then. Well, IRS knows, I suppose, but uh, <laughs> uh, well, I guess, yeah, I mean, there's always an inherent risk, but you should manage that risk. I mean, $190, even back then, you know, when I was making like $25,000 a year or whatever, I mean, that was it wasn't like going to bankrupt me or anything, but I would have been pissed if $190 got flushed down the drain. And that, well, I, I a Pixel phone died and I got pissed about, you know, $600 going down the drain. You got to balance like, is this going to make me this or is this going to ruin me? Yes, I would say that. So it, it, what do they, it, it's like investing or gambling. Don't gamble more than you can afford to lose. And I would say if you're getting started out in hacking and I mean, I still wreck stuff and I certainly, wreck, well, I certainly wreck more things in the past. So I would say, yeah, um, start small. And I, like we mentioned video games, like video games, you, the more, a lot of those consoles are fairly cheap. And so if you want to get into stuff, find something that's cheap and plentiful and cut your teeth there, like learn the ropes there and then move on to the more expensive things where failure could be detrimental. Thank you. Got a few more minutes, right? 45? Yeah, we got a couple more. A couple more before they get the hook. Anyone else? Yes, sir. What's next? Nice shirt. What's next for the Raspberry Pi or Elmic 14? So they did a hack like heck challenge. So basically, uh, since I'm uh, leaving, they're finding new content creators. No, well, what's next for the device? Or, well. Oh, the, the Raspberry Pi portable device that we made? Um, I'm working on trying to basically come up with a carrier board for that so we can sell it as a kit. Um, I know Elma 14 doesn't like the Raspberry Pi Zero because it's a $5 device that does not cost $5. Um, kind of like movie pass, uh, but uh, yeah. So basically, it would be a carrier board. It would have the um, it have the USB. Uh, I'm sorry, the LiPo charger, the um, what's it called, the USB uh, hub. Uh, basically, all that stuff we built on one PCB. You plug it into Raspberry Pi, then you plug an LCD into it, and you can approximate what we did on the show. Uh, the thing I'm struggling with is I'm not sure if we can make it as slim, you know, this in this direction as we did on the show if it's something that plugs together. Because you see a lot of those things like those Adafruit boards that plug in the Raspberry Pi, they add up in thickness really quick. Whereas, yeah, the thing that Felix and I built, I mean, we actually built two more of them because we were so happy with it because Element 14 will, of course, do a giveaway of the one we built. But Felix and I are like, we want our own. That doesn't happen very often. That <laughs> we like actually duplicate the projects. So we, yeah, we're actually next week is what I'm, what I'm working on it. We're working on trying to figure out a, basically a PCB that we can make as a kit. So you can plug it in and very quickly have your Raspberry Pi be a game system. And of course I told them, everyone loves video games. So if you make it like, oh, it's a game, then people will be more excited about it than just some carrier board. Uh, you have time for one more or should, we, should I leave? Uh, you can do one more. One more question. Uh, maybe, yes, sir. Is the most important skill to, to get started? You know, anywhere from soldering, circuit board making, to 3D printing. Soldering. soldering. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I started when I was 10, I think, and I kind of got away from it for a while. And I would say, I don't know, I'm still learning. But I mean, if you, I mean, if you can solder poorly and it'll work. But it's better that you solder well, especially if you're trying to like run a bunch of wires everywhere because the, the thickness and mass of wires is really easy to forget about when you're building something. You know, I mean, not everything's like a, like a Cray computer, but you're like, oh crap, I got all this stuff here, but I don't have any room for the wires. And then you're like, I have to start over. Like when we did the Hack Like Heck Challenge, I actually was sitting there judging everyone's wiring. Actually, when, when, I, when I was hiring assistants, I, everyone had to bring in a soldering example and I totally judged them for it. So, all right, well, thanks for coming.